Okay, and we're about to begin the panel session right now. And of course, I welcome you to the final day of the GYSS. And let us all get started in the morning's program with a panel discussion on innovation and entrepreneurship in science, transforming research into impact. And the panel features for today are Professor Ben Frenga. We also have Professor Randy Shackman, Professor Sir Shankar Balasubramaniam, and Dr. Alice Chen. Moderating the panel today will be Mr. Xianhui Tong, Executive Director of Investments at SG Innovate, a Singapore government agency that supports entrepreneurship centered on the development of deep technology. Now, please warmly welcome the panel and our moderator, and I'll hand the session over to Mr. Tong. Hands together. Looks like I didn't have to moderate the first part of where everyone sits. Well, thank you very much. A very good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks for coming early for this session. Uh, I was about to give an introduction to SG Innovate, but it looks like uh, you know, the MC has already done so, so I'm going to skip that part uh, and just go straight into the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the meat and potatoes, so to speak, uh, of the panel itself. As we all know, you know, emerging technologies are very difficult to translate into commercializable outcomes. Uh, but nonetheless, they remain very important uh, in terms of uh, solving some of the world's biggest problems. I think the uh, biggest or the most obvious example was how mRNA enabled all of us to actually be here today face to face uh, instead of doing this over Zoom. And, uh, you know, but you know, the pathway for the commercialization of such Emerging technologies is not always a smooth one and it's not always uh, something that can be easily prescribed. So I'm really honoured today to have you know, four panellists who have taken slightly different pathways on the journey towards uh, commercialising emerging technologies. Uh, and perhaps in Alice's case, she's actually driving the bus that takes people on that particular journey. So I'd like to welcome my four panellists and I'll give a short introduction to each of them. Uh, I've gotten their indulgence to just give a very short prissy as to their profile. Uh, for a more detailed list of their accomplishments and accolades, I think you can read them online and it's going to take you a very long time because they are very accomplished people. So I'll start with uh, Professor Sir Shankar Balasubramaniam, uh, winner of the Millennium Technology Prize in 2020. He was knighted by the Queen in 2017 for services to science and medicine. Uh, interestingly, he was the founder of Solexa, which was sold to Illumina in 2006 for, two, two, uh, for $600 million. Uh, he's the founder of Cambridge Epigenetics, which raised $88 million just a couple of years ago. And he is the Herschel Smith Professor of Medicinal Chemistry at Cambridge University. His research and inventions have revolutionized gene sequencing industry and form actually the core of Illumina's technology. Next, we have uh, Professor Ben Feringa, winner of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2016, appointed Commander of the Order of Netherlands Lion in 2016. He's currently the Academy Professor, amongst his other appointments, uh, Academy Professor, Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. And his research has led to the development of a molecular rotary motor, which has applications in a wide variety of fields including adaptive devices and molecular uh, catalysts. Professor Randy Shackman, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2013, currently Professor of Cell Biology Development and Physiology at UC Berkeley. And his research actually has revealed the mechanism behind the transportation and secretion of proteins in our cells, which is actually critical to many body functions. Last but not least, Dr. Alice Chen obtained a PhD from Stanford University in protein engineering and ca characterization. And after a distinguished career in drug development with several biotech companies, she joined Accelerator Life Science Partners in 2013 
where she serves as executive vice president. ALSP, as the name suggests, works to develop and commercialize emerging biotech, and Alice was personally involved with companies like Rodeo Therapeutics, which was acquired by Amgen. So as you can see, a very, uh, you know, a very uh, you know, accomplished uh, set of people on the panel, people with varying backgrounds, varying technologies, uh, varying experiences as well, and uh, you know, we look forward to the panel uh, to come. So I think uh, the first question, just to warm up the, the panel, I, I would like to ask uh, you know, the panelists, you know, how did you actually decide on the areas of focus when you, you undertook your research? You know, and what was driving the decision behind what areas that you, you, know, you wanted to undertake the research and what were the areas of consideration? Perhaps, Shankar, I can start with you on that. Sure, happy to take that. <clears throat> well, um, I guess I'd start by saying at the beginning of my academic career, I, I hadn't made the decision about exactly what was I uh, aiming to do in the long term. And so I, I took the advice of colleagues and actually spent a few years exploring quite, quite different research problems. And um, in many ways, looking for something that uh, sort of had legs to provide um, a long-term um, area for me to focus and, and build on, um, wh you know, where I felt um, the, the problem was a, a big problem that could potentially uh, make a big difference. And so it, being in Cambridge, I think the environment that you choose to be in does influence you. And um, you know, being in Cambridge, you, it's not long before you start thinking about DNA because you're just surrounded by um, legends of um, scientists, um, sculptures, figures, and so forth uh, about the history of, of certain discoveries. So I think that, that played a role, actually. I was in a department uh, across the road is another department where major discoveries were made. So you naturally, uh, yeah, that's part of the staple of what you, you grow up in um, culturally. Thanks, Shankar. Uh, ben, what about yourself? Yeah, um, to start with, you should realize before I start my independent academic career as a young yeah, assistant professor, I worked six and a half years at Shell, the multinational company, the big multinational company. <laughs> And there my focus of research was on catalysis for five years. And I had already some training in catalysis because basically I'm a chemist, a synthetic chemist. But catalysis is the beating heart of every chemical process in industry. So obviously when I went back to, to university, you know, there are so many questions in catalysis yeah, and so many challenges that I pursue a program in, in, in catalysis. Yeah? And, and I have a very broad interest, so I, I thought, Maybe I don't only want to work in catalysis, you know, but I also want to, to do something completely different. And at that time, there were some possibilities to apply for grants, and, and, and I thought maybe we should, we should do something with the information storage, different from how the physics people do it, you know, with the transistors and so. So molecular information storage, like Mother Nature does it, you know, in your eye. I mentioned this this week during my lecture. So I had this idea of doing information processing and storage, you know, with molecules. And this is how it all started, this other part of my program, uh, ultimately molecular machines, molecular motors, etc. And then in the last uh, 10 years or so, or say eight years, I learned a completely different di discipline to work together with cell biologists and in particularly with the medical schools. We have joined PhD students now with the medical people and one third of my group is working on bio problems like photopharmacology and imaging and precisely targeting, say, anti-tumor drugs and so. And there, I also benefited from the fact that I, first of all, I worked one and a half years in the Bioscience Center of Shell in UK, where I met a lot of friends in the bio community. And second, in Groningen, uh, this is a classical university, and we had this very international flavor. So we got a lot of, I mean, we had a very good biochemistry and cell biology department and a very big medical school. But furthermore, we had always, when I was a young graduate student or undergraduate, we had already lots of international distinguished speakers. And that sparked my interest, you know, because when you get exposure to many different areas of your field, yeah, in the broader sense, it sparks your interest and you think, oh, wow, this is cool, maybe I should do this. And of course, you have to make choices 
And that's what everybody, also when I talk with all of you, I hear always the same as I had, it's difficult to make a choice. What should I do in the beginning? And so, but this was my incentive, feeling safe in catalysis because I knew that the, what the challenges were and what I could do. And second, to do something entirely di different. But it was tricky, eh? It was very, uh, you don't know, the uncertainty, but you know you do something that can give you a name because you do something nobody else has done before. Yeah, to make these choices, I got an advice from a very famous professor in the Netherlands when I started, when I was a young guy. And he said, choose an important problem. Don't only jump on the bandwagon. And I think this is important, you know. Be confident. Choose something. Don't think everybody has been done, you know, by the famous professors here. Yeah? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know thanks. what I mean. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks, Ben. Uh, Randy? Um, when I was in university, I developed an interest in chromosome replication. And uh, the way I was studying it was... Um, not as fully reductionist as, as appealed to me from courses and lectures that I heard. And so I had the opportunity uh, for my PhD to work with uh, one of the great biochemists of the second half of the 20th century, Arthur Kornberg. And from him, I learned how to take a complicated a <clears throat> uh, problem uh, apart, piece by piece, systematically, with precision, and with uh, um, uh, you know, tireless work. He had a very strong work ethic from which I uh, gained uh, confidence in my own ability to tackle a tough problem. Uh, but the field, uh, and in general, nucleic acids, was becoming uh, very competitive and contentious. It was the birth of the recombinant DNA revolution. And um, just because of my own temperament, I wanted to explore a new area that was underdeveloped where I might be able to use the tools that I learned from Kornberg to apply to a different biological problem. Uh, I was introduced to the work of the great cell biologist George Pallotti, um, both as a graduate student and then as a postdoctoral fellow. And in the first month that I was a postdoc, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for his dissection of the secretory pathway using traditional tools of electron microscopy and cell fractionation. Um, and on hearing him de deliver a version of his Nobel lecture, I was struck by the beauty but complexity of the problem. And yet what I realized at that moment in 1974 uh, there was at that, at that time not a single molecule, either protein or lipid, known to have a role in this process. There was much speculation, but no evidence whatsoever. And so uh, I decided to borrow from various other disciplines, uh, genetics and biochemistry and cell biology, to craft a new approach, which I was able to start as a beginning assistant professor in Berkeley in 1976, and with the uh, great uh, help of tremendous graduate students who shared my passion, we were able to use uh, a variety of techniques to define aspects of the mechanism of protein secretion. Now, I was uh, never introduced to any practical applications of anything that I did. Uh, when I started, uh, there was no biotechnology industry. It was not typical for biochemists or cell biologists working in these topics to patent anything. And yet, when we discovered that yeast cells, which is what we used to map the secretory pathway genetically, we discovered that the genes that we had uh, discovered uh, had homologs in the human genome, which was subsequently sequenced. It became clear to the then emerging biotechnology industry that, that yeast could be a, a useful, very, in fact, important platform for the manufacture of very large quantities of clinically relevant proteins. And so uh, I was delighted to be able to assist uh, a local biotech company that had just emerged to use yeast to introduce the genes for human insulin or the gene for hepatitis B surface antigen into yeast. And these then developed over, over a few years into a major commercial source of antigens and proteins for therapeutic application. This was, for me, a complete revelation. And although I've never had any interest in starting a company myself, 
I have had the, the good fortune and pleasure, really, of consulting with companies using my own uh, passion for basic science to apply it uh, to therapeutic intervention. So that connection, which it has as its foundation a, a consistent and long-term investment in basic science, I believe is what is essential for technological development in any country around the world. Thanks, Randy. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Alice will look at the problem from a slightly different angle. Uh, so her question isn't how you decide on uh, you know, how, what kind of research you undertake, but rather from an investment perspective, from a cultivation perspective, what kind of companies or what kind of research do you try to identify that you, know, you think would be suitable to commercialize? Uh, Alice? Sure thing. And first, I'm uh, completely starstruck by this panel. Um, what we do in biotech, in life sciences, in life science investment is to, to do work that stands on the shoulders of giants. So whether it's on proteins, on sequencing, on catalysis, without any of which we cannot do what we do today. So uh, with that, um, I, I'm in the space of early stage life science development and also investment. Um, to the question in terms of what kind of technologies are we invest in, I would say generally speaking in life sciences, number one, uh, we want to solve an important question. So to uh, the technology that we invest in will need to first be addressing important questions. Uh, beyond that, we then go into the technology itself and Personally, I think there are two parameters that we definitely look at. Number one, differentiation to existing approaches, if there are existing approaches. Uh, and that can come in a variety of ways in terms of how a technology differentiates from other, uh, other technologies uh, that's being developed and also existing uh, in the world. Number two is beyond differentiation, we need to understand the potential of uh, being better, so the superiority components uh, to the technology, we might not be able to, because we're in early stage uh, development, a lot of times the superiority cannot be realized at the time of investment. But in uh, at the onset of investments, we need to understand the potential and that there is a way for us to approach uh, the technology so that we can realize uh, that both differentiation and superiority. Beyond those key parameters, then we go into very um, industry-specific, firm-specific uh, strategies. I would say, generally speaking, technologies need to, to have an IP, especially in life sciences, needs to have an IP uh, parameter, an IP uh, approach so that we know that it is a technology that can be protected and therefore can be developed and invested. Um, and then we go into operational feasibility. We go into the team that's behind the team, which uh, b behind the technology, which will then feed into the operational feasibility of how we can carry forward uh, the technology from benchtop to bedside to then uh, to, to the broader patient population. Um, and then beyond that, there will be things such as investment strategy fit, uh, and also what kind of uh, resources that the investment team can fit with the technology. Because when in the future, hopefully a lot of you will be able to uh, have new ideas and new technologies to go out and fundraise. Um, it is a two-way street. While the investors look into the technology to see whether it's an investable technology for the firm, the technology should also have the, uh, the opportunity to evaluate the, the investors to see that there are uh, value adds from the investor to the technology itself. So it's a two-way street that we can communicate. Thanks, Alice. Uh, I, I want to go back to the, uh, to the initial question and based on the answers uh, provided by, by the three of you uh, initially, um, you know, it is clear to me that, you know, obviously you guys are considerable risk takers, you know, entrepreneurial in a certain sense uh, from a scientific perspective. But, uh, and I, I, this is no disrespect to any of the undergrad, like postgraduate students here, but, you know, a lot of them would prefer to, to take on, you know, safer approaches to science, you know. 
more, slightly more incremental, slightly safer approaches where the outcomes are perhaps less risky than what you, guys, what you have undertaken. How, how would you get people to change that kind of mindset? You know, we, we all constantly face this problem. You know? Universities, they churn out a lot of IP, which is incremental in nature, which, would not make, which we would find difficult to commercialize because it doesn't make such a considerable difference in the market that you know, it, would, it would work. Uh, from a practical standpoint. Um, perhaps, uh, Ben, you could start with that question. Now, <clears throat> first of all, let me say, if you are at a university or a research center and you are at the, at the early stage of your career, be, be a bit daring. Don't talk, think too much about, you know, uh, go on the safe route. It, it, it is, it's not a problem to make a mistake or to fail or so. That's why you are there, you know, and to learn and to... And entrepreneurship, but also research, you know, it has to do with, of course, taking risks. I always tell my friends when they ask me, you know, why, why are you a researcher, you know, eh? and not have another job, you know, where you can earn maybe more money. I said, look, if you don't, cannot stand risk and uncertainty, don't become a scientist, you know. Because I don't know what we will discover tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. We go beyond our horizon. But the beauty is, you know, that together with our team of all these talented young people, and I see here all these young talented people in front of me, the creativity, the mindset, the new things, you know, to try something different, yeah? Don't be too afraid. That's my, my message. Be, and I encourage you, you know, to, to try something. And of course, sometimes you will fail. Don't worry. That's in science, but that's also in entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurship, as he can better tell this, but it goes also with uncertainty, I think. And that is be confident. Be confident about your own uh, possibilities. And uh, yeah, when I, st when I started, you know, I had also this uncertainty of what should I do, you know? But I felt confident that I had a good basis in chemistry, and chemistry is everywhere, so there is a lot to be discovered. And now it gets even more excited because after 30 years in catalysis, I mentioned catalysis, you know now we have to build sustainable chemical industries and the making industry of the future. How are we going to make things in the future? More sustainable, recycling, we can come to that later about innovation. There is catalysis is, is, is the beating heart, you know, we, we have to invent new ways to do these chemistries. Now, with respect to entrepreneurship, very briefly, yeah, I started two companies, and we are in the process now of another two companies, you know, startup companies at the moment. So we started a company in catalysis, yeah, and uh, uh, that was uh, very successful. And then at a certain point, it cost me too much time, so we we sold it, you know, because it merged with a pharma company that wanted to have more catalysis and synthesis uh, expertise, etc. So I didn't lose money, but I did not become a millionaire. But it was a great exercise for me and my students, you know, how to start something successful and bring it further. And the second company we started was uh, Lumento. That was a photopharma company. So make precision yeah, therapies. Yeah? But also, sometimes I simply don't start a company because we work a lot together with, for instance, the nuclear medicine and the imaging in the, in the hospital. And we develop methodologies, and I'm extremely proud that we could bring it to, to be used in the hospitals. It's used now in the clinic. Methods for PET imaging and for fluorescent imaging, new methods that is accessible to everybody. Yeah? And if people want to start a company, please go ahead. But I find it more, uh, I think it's, it's, it's really nice that we see now in the clinic that it's really used, you know. We started in the lab four years ago and it's already in the clinic. Yeah? But I can tell you, it is, a, it is really great to have something, you know, at a certain point that really goes into a production or into a product. We had, a, a, for instance, in catalysis several years ago, we had discovered a new catalyst, yeah? Nobody had, had done this, and it was 200 times cheaper than what was used in industry. The DSM company, which is a big chemical company, yeah, had a serious problem with the drug to how to do a certain catalytic hydrogenation in this case. They put, they realized the, the importance of the discovery, and together, you know, it was evolved. They put a lot of effort, and within six months, yeah, they produced multi kilogram scales of an intermediate for the drug that was used for phase three clinical tests or whatever, you know. Within six months, they had a full swung operation running. 
I was really proud on that, you know, to keep that going. I think that is also something that gives you a lot of, uh, how do you call it, a great feeling, you know, that your science is useful and can be helped to solve to solve a real life problem. That's some of my experiences I had. Thanks, Ben. That's very interesting. Um, Randy, do you have an, any advice for, for uh, you know, potential postgrads looking at uh, projects and how do, we, do you encourage them to take a similar pathway yeah. like yourselves, a more daring one versus the more yeah. uh, safer path? Well, I certainly agree with what, what Ben has said about being uh, risk-taking. Uh, in order to do, to do great science, you have to be a, a gambler. You have to be willing to explore the unknown or else you'll just be left to clean up things that other people have started. So one way, one way to prepare yourself for this is when, when you finish your PhD work, I think it's very important to do a postdoc in a completely different subject, using a different approach or uh, a different system or a different question. Uh, and when you have that leavening experience of working in a different environment on a different question, when you then have, if you then have an opportunity to have an independent faculty position, you, you have diverse experience uh, on which to base a choice to choose your own problem. Uh, I think, unfortunately, too many students, um, postdocs, are too conservative. Something works for them, they think they're an expert in that topic, and then, then they just feel that they have to turn the crank. Indeed, that's reinforced, unfortunately, by the grant system, uh, certainly in the US, and probably here too, when you uh, propose something new that uh, you haven't had direct experience in, it's very difficult to get funding. This was my own experience since I chose to do something for which I had no particular training, although I had been very successful as a graduate student the granting agencies viewed me as uh, uh, naive, inexperienced, I had no preliminary data, and my first NIH grant was completely trashed with one comment that uh, went something like, uh, how can he propose this, it's never been done. Well, I, I thought that was the object, to do something new. And I have no regret about having failed at that level because as I said, I had the benefit at Berkeley of fantastic students, and within a year, we had uh, justified what uh, the federal government had failed to uh, had failed to recognize that there were some interesting ideas to be pursued. Now, uh, uh, let me emphasize uh, from my own perspective that I feel it continues to be essential for university investigators to engage in basic science, uh, and so I feel although I'm delighted to see the practical applications of what I and my colleagues have done, I feel uh, quite strongly that investigators at universities must be in a position to publish openly what they have discovered. And I'm very concerned about relationships that some faculty have with companies that preclude their disclosure of what they discovered in the, new, in the university. We in the university seek knowledge uh, for its own value there is a beauty in discovery and science that goes well beyond practical application. And it is essential that universities maintain that focus on basic discovery wherever it takes us. When you make a fundamental discovery, there will inevitably be bright people out there of an entrepreneurial bent who will take that on and apply it. Uh, but that should be done largely outside of the university where uh, intellectual property and secrecy may be important. That must not be allowed to, uh, to dampen uh, our enthusiasm for open discourse and publication in the university. Thanks, Randy, and certainly uh, an interesting perspective uh, which perhaps may not resonate with all within the uh, higher education uh, administration. Um, but you know, I should let uh, Shankar also offer his opinion on, on the matter with regards to how do you encourage more students to take bigger risks? Well, I firstly agree with uh, what both of my colleagues have said. And um, I just want to, for, for a moment, revisit this word risk. I think it means different things to different people, actually. And um, 
Ra rather, rather like a, sort of one's definition of an experiment that didn't work. A student comes to me and says, it didn't work. I'll say, what do you mean the thing fell out of your hands and smashed on the floor? And they'll say, no. This is what I did and this is what I saw. Um, so I think risk and also whether something works or not uh, tends to be a rather subjective reflection of expectation. Um, so I, I, um, I had similar advice when I, when I was a postdoc with um, a brilliant scientist called Stephen Benkovic uh, and I left to start my own lab. He took me aside in his office and reflected on what I'd been doing in his lab and what I'd done in my PhD. And he said, you're going to start your own career now. He said, you, you love this stuff that we've been doing. I love this stuff. But you have to go and do something different. And um, if you do it well, you might create a new area of science. That's what you need to do. So I, I remember feeling a little bit upset, actually, at the time, because uh, I had to move away from everything that I knew and loved and find something new <laughs> that was not yet defined. And actually, I've given the same advice to every person in my lab who's gone and formed their own group. And I usually add a corollary that, because they also get upset. <laughs> um, and what I say is, in 10 years' time, you might thank me for this. And some of them have actually come back and um, said, I, I now understand. Um, so perception of risk. I think there are there are two ways that um, something can be risky. One, one, it's just what you aim to do is technically very, very challenging. Okay, so technical risk is real risk. And you know, my my view on this is, if it's not breaking the laws of physics as we know it, then it it must be feasible. It's not impossible. I certainly applied that principle to what led to the uh, sequencing work. There were so many independent problems that needed to be solved to reduce that to practice. But each on its own was, was logically solvable. That was my um, sort of um, thought process for de-risking this. Um, so I think in any problem in, in, in basic science, um, providing you're not violating any uh, fundamental laws, it's, it's solvable. Now, the, the, the other way to de-risk it is time. Time is a risk mitigator in research. Now, g going back to uh, what, what I said early in my, uh, my talk a couple of days ago, um, I, I was told to choose a big problem that was important or, or could be important. I should also stress the importance of something may only become apparent sometime in the future. So we should also be careful about the uh, temporal nature of judging whether something is, is important or, or not yet important, but could be important in the future. I think they count as well. Um, choosing a problem that requires at least 10 years to work on. You, you, can, you can make a lot of mistakes and learn from those mistakes over time. And I think that is a an important risk mitigator. My, my personal view is, if you work on a well-established problem alongside thousands of other groups and people in the world, I consider that a very risky thing to do. It's my view. You're gonna be looking over your shoulder every minute in every journal. My goodness, and, and, and you have so many papers to read every week and try and be original. It's a moving window. I think it's far less risky to be the first person on the moon and report on what you observe because no one's done it before. I, I don't consider that to be risky. I think it's less risky. Now, I've, I've had three, three startup companies that I never predicted that have come out of uh, work that we were doing. I told you a story about one. Now, in that particular case, once we saw what was possible based on the uh, basic observations we made, 
we, we actually started a company not to be entrepreneurs or because we wanted to generate a business. At, at that time, in the UK funding system, it was the only way to raise enough funds to build a team to tackle all the different aspects of the problem um, and converge on where we wanted to go. So the, the company was actually a vehicle to um, finance and get the work done. Now, the second company um, I started, a company called Cambridge Epigenetics that has now been renamed as Biomodal, came out because we were, um, there was a discovery of a, a sixth base, if you will, in DNA called hydroxymethyl cytosine. And I had a phone call from my colleague, Tony Green, in hematology, who said, have you looked at the latest edition of science? And I said, no. He said, turn to this page. So I did. And th there were two back-to-back -back papers. And he said, this, this is going to be really important. This modification in human DNA, and we, we have no idea what it's doing there. Do you think you could come up with a chemistry to detect it and sequence it? Because we're going to need that. So he suggested the problem, and I worked on it with one PhD student. And in two years, we solved it, published it. We patented it before we published it. And then I was approached by 35 companies in one week. And I thought, gosh, this, <laughs> this looks like it could be interesting. So we, we actually we started a company to commercialize uh, epigenetic sequencing. Um, the third uh, is in an area on secondary DNA secondary structures um, that I've worked on for 25 years. And um, during that time, uh, over a window of 15 years, I was approached by investors multiple times trying to persuade me to start a company based on our publications. I was approached by two pharmaceutical companies to ask me if I would establish um, a therapeutic program in their company. So I, I was a little bit bemused because my perspective was that we didn't really understand what was going on. So why would you try and do something applied? So we kept going. Now, after 25 years, um, I finally felt we understood enough to try and spark something um, useful out of it. So we, we, we started a, a therapeutic company last year, um, again from that. Now, coming to the question of what, what can we do to encourage this, I, I think the point about granting agencies is, is it's, a, it's, it's a general issue globally. And I've actually been in discussions within granting agencies when they have posed the question, how can we encourage more adventurous grant applications? Now, the, the, the irony is they are actually the gatekeepers of um, what gets funded and what doesn't get funded. And um, my, my own experience is uh, the first 10 years of my career, most of my grants were rejected on the grounds that they were too risky. And then the ones that started getting funded uh, would always, you'd get some commentary on, you know, this is what we liked. Here are some areas where there were some concerns. And my, my grants that even got funded were always, there was a sentence at the end, we think this is very risky, but we have to fund one or two grants in our portfolio at the riskier end. Um, so I actually used to be quite pleased to, uh, to, to get these, these, these comments. But this is a problem, actually. I think grant committees and uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the behavior of groups of people sat around a table trying to build a consensus. It's very difficult to build a consensus around um, something that is original, whose importance hasn't yet emerged. Um, but but I, I do think we should, we should explore very, very different ways of funding science and scientists. Um, in, in order to allow more free original thinking to have a chance. So it means that the, the focus is really very much on those uh, grant agencies uh, being a little bit more, having a higher appetite for risk themselves versus uh, you know, taking a less risky approach to, to grants. So, so I suppose that's uh, a question for another day <laughs> and certainly a different panel.
Um, Alice, maybe may I come back to you? Uh, and obviously, you've seen a lot of startups, and, and you've invested in a lot of IP coming out of universities uh, and helping to translate them into the market. How, how can I mean? I know this is a pretty general question, so you can narrow it down to your specific area, which is in biotech. How, how can these companies actually grow faster? Um, either through involvement of, I mean, money is obvious. I mean, you, you throw more money at the problem, and ultimately, it will become a uh, you know, a, a billion dollar company, even if you've thrown $10 billion at, at the business. Um, but what other factors do you think uh, would be helpful? Right. Uh, number one, I, I would say, especially early stage life sciences, we are very much focused on technology and science um, because the science will have to work. And in that, the biology, chemistry will have to work and biology will have to work. Um, and different parts of drug development will have to work. Uh, in terms of how to speed things up, uh, there are multiple ways in addition to capital. Uh, number one is what kind of resourcing would be necessary for the technology and can we uh, collate all the resources that we need and then find them for our portfolio companies. Uh, that would be technical resources that would be supporting uh, resources, back office resources. So can we uh, have, can we build the network that will then bring all the resourcing necessary for our portfolio companies so that they move forward? And a lot of times the network will need to be built uh, over time because it starts from our relationships with um, the academic world, universities and research institutions. It's with uh, contract research organizations that uh, has a lot of work that's being done uh, in our industry. That is, and we need to have uh, connections with uh, key opinion leaders in the field and also at the end of the day with pharma companies um, so that we, we are on track. When we're ready to grow our portfolio companies, we would have um, people with the expertise and also the dollars to continue the growth uh, of the technology. So in short, I would say it's building all the resources that's required in drug development and in translational science so that we can continue to bring them forward. Talent is another one. I think that that also takes a long time to build from university to uh, to industry. I, I think uh, talent is, uh, is generally a big, big, chal a big challenge for every country, especially in areas that are new you know, it's uh, you know, a lot of people think, okay, if I if I train a life science uh, postgraduate, you know, he can do anything under the sun. He or she can do anything under the sun. It's not always the case. Um, okay, before I go on to my next set of questions for the panelists, I'd just like to let uh, everyone here know that I'll probably leave a few minutes, maybe 20, 30 minutes for questions from the floor. Um, so please prepare your questions. Uh, and if you would like to ask them, then you, know, you can go to one of the mics. Uh, in about 10, 15 minutes time, and I'll, uh, I'll open the floor for questions to any one of the panelists. Uh, the panelists did not know that I was gonna do this, but I'm sure that they are <laughs> happy to take those questions. Okay, so with that said, um, maybe I'll just continue uh, with, with Randy. Um, obviously, you're doing lots of research in, in different areas, and you, know, you, you did highlight uh, uh, you know, your opinion with respect to the ultimate impact of that research, but nonetheless, you are in an area where there is tremendous impact on, on the things that you discover. Um, have you identified or do you think there's anything promising in the pipeline or that you've already done that will make uh, a big impact from a healthcare perspective? Uh, yes, um, although I have not started a company myself, I've focused in my lab entirely on basic science. I've consulted for a half a dozen companies um, one that's particularly exciting to me, based on my work on extracellular vesicles, is a company in Boston that has devised a way of detecting um, uh, tumor antigens that are coincident on individual uh, extracellular vesicles in blood plasma. They have a very clever technique to identify the coincidence of three different tumor antigens on single particles in populations of millions of such particles in a crude blood plasma uh, uh, sample. So uh, I'm quite excited by what they're doing. The, the data that they have is really outstanding. It's nothing that I would do in my own laboratory, but I'm happy to contribute to that with my knowledge uh, 
about extracellular vesicles, which I think for me is the proper balance between um, a, uh, an investment in basic science and its application outside of the university. Yesterday I spoke about a much larger uh, approach that I'm delighted to be involved in, which is um, in support of Parkinson's basic science that is um, funded by the Sergey Brin Family Foundation. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday morning, I, I spoke of uh, Mr. Brin, uh, co-founder of Google, obviously enormously wealthy, but unfortunately has a family genetic history of Parkinson's disease. And so he has been investing hundreds of millions of dollars in initially in the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is a major philanthropic arm for Parkinson families and clinical research, but he decided quite independently that what really was essential was a, a more purely basic science approach. And so I was asked when my wife uh, died of Parkinson's disease to lead this effort, and we have now um, given out over half a billion dollars to research teams around the world uh, with the condition that they openly discuss their preliminary results among uh, the hundreds of members of our network, that they uh, publish in open access journals, that they post their work on, on the bioarchive when it's ready to publish. And uh, our program is focused entirely on basic science. We are not funding drug discovery. We are not funding clinical trials. But the, the, there are a number of entrepreneurial people in this network who have started their own companies. They're free to uh, develop intellectual property on what they do with funding from the Brin Foundation. Um, but we will not support uh, the uh, clinical applications. But we expect that the basic discoveries that we'll, we make will absolutely uh, end up in the clinic. And again, it, it, uh, my, my focus, my passion is entirely for basic science with the conviction that from this will come discoveries of great impact. Thanks, Randy. Um, Shankar, a slightly different question for yourself. Uh, you know, we have talked a little bit about the companies uh, you have built, uh, but certainly the one that is uppermost in my mind is Solexa, your first one, um, when you were perhaps a little bit less well known than you are today. Um, what was that journey like? You know, there, there are lots of anecdotes that center around the fact that it came out, it started over beer or something like that. Um, you know, based on what David has shared with some of the others uh, last year. Um, but I'd like to take, you know, hear from you what, what your take was. How was that translation effect, uh, you know, uh, made? Well, um, I guess I'll start by um, reminding everyone that that, that project commenced with a really basic, if you will, even probably considered quite a high-risk project because we were building instrumentation um, that, that gave us a new observation technique on a fundamentally important enzyme-catalyzed reaction um, in, in living systems, and that is the uh, nucleotide ion transfer reaction catalyzed by... Um, generally by all DNA polymerases. So we, uh, I still have a copy of that grant application actually and uh, it's quite short and we had to send it to two places before it got funded and in terms of the objectives, there's a sentence I wrote and it, it was worded something like we're, we're using a new observation technique to look at this fundamentally important enzymatic reaction. It's important for all living systems um, because we, we believe we'll learn something new about its mechanism. That was it. And um, I'm pretty sure it would not get funded today in, in, in the UK based, based on how we positioned it because you, you have to sort of um, fill out pathways to doing something useful. How, how can you impute why something's going to be useful when you haven't done it and you don't know what the outcomes are? I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so so we, we started with basic research, um, and we were not looking to do anything translational. And it, it's when we got the funding and we started doing experiments and iterating around design of experiments 
um, that it, it, it occurred to us somewhat naively at first that actually you could use this approach to read the strand of DNA. It was just an incidental thing. We still didn't see anything transformational in that. It was just a, oh, that's, that's interesting. Never thought of that. And um, it, it wasn't one discussion down the pub. I mean, I, I think, um, let's be clear, we, we had iterative discussions over quite a period of time where we were just brainstorming and building up ideas. Which, which by the way, for all you young people out there, one of the most enjoyable parts of science is, is, is just jousting with your peers about ideas, bouncing ideas around. This is for free and it's, it's rapid. And I definitely in encourage you to engage in that because it's, it's, it's enjoyable. And for every thousand ideas you have, one of them might be a gem and you'll recognize it when, when you have it. So, so we were actually, we were bouncing around a lot and with our, our, our postdocs as well. And, and then we reached a stage where we thought, oh, may, maybe this could be useful and maybe we should, do you think we should do something about it? It was, it was almost a sense of, do we have a responsibility? Having had the thoughts and made the observations to do something actively about pushing it in this direction. And, and that's when we, um, not being experts at all in this field, we, we went to talk to the human genome people to give us context. You know, are we, are we being ridiculous in, in, in thinking this might be useful or, or could it actually uh, be transformational? And, and actually that, that was important, talking to experts and other people. Um, can, another sort of word of advice for young people, um, important things don't, in my view, they don't, they don't come out of one person thinking in abstract terms. It, they get shaped by uh, iterative thinking of ideas, often with, with, with other people or teams. And then the contextualization of that, w whether it's a scientific contextualization or indeed a business, commercial contextualization, if you want to turn it into a business, um, comes out of talking to people who know much more than you do about a subject that could be affected by uh, your, your thinking or your activities. So that, that, that gave us the confidence to believe that this, this could be important in the future. Um, so um, we, we actually still wrote a grant application to the Wellcome Trust, which I kept, to fund this project. And um, it was a sort of preliminary application. They said, this looks interesting. Send us a, send us a proper one. And before we did that, I said to David, look, I think this project might need more than two people for three years to give it a chance, because there are so many different components. And um, I'd had a chance meeting with um, a venture capital company in one of the colleges in Cambridge. So in Cambridge, we have these, there's the university and there are these colleges. And the, the colleges are collections of scholars of all disciplines of all types. And um, I, I guess the thinking was to bring people together on a regular basis who, who really think quite differently about everything. And um, so someone had organized a thing and uh, we'd met venture capitalists. Now, I'd heard about venture capitalists. And I have to say, what I'd heard um, didn't... Um, didn't make me feel these are the kinds of people I want to hang out with, um, if, if I'm honest. And um, so we, we, we had this meeting where we were asked to just present science, basic science. And um, th this particular group of um, venture capitalists, one was clinically trained, one was a chemist, the other had a scientific background in biology. To my surprise, they were asking each of us really penetrating scientific questions, not what I was expecting. Um, and it, it was actually, it was more invigorating than some academic conferences that I'd been to in my specialized area, and not what I was expecting at all. 
And then we had a dinner and some wine, and the, the, the head said to me, if you ever have an idea that you think might be appropriate for a company, give me a call. So I, I said to David Klenerman, maybe we should try and raise some venture capital money because we're going to need continuous resource ramping up um, to do this. So uh, we gave them a call. Um, again, we, w we were quite naive. We, we went along with um, four diagrams printed out on a piece of paper. And actually, if you go to uh, Illumina's headquarters, you'll see these diagrams um, framed on the wall um, w with my signature. They're very, very, very simple. You saw some of them in my talk. And so we, we just explained our thinking. Now, um, the, the, the reaction from the venture capitalists was um, that they thought this was extremely high risk, technically bringing it all together into a system. But when they saw the, um, the, the potential advantage of a thousandfold or 10,000fold, they, they couldn't let go. So we, we went through a period, they sent me around the world meeting all their scientific experts to, to diligence me and the, the project. And, and, and eventually they funded it. Now, um, this particular venture capital firm were, um, at that time, they were very different. They were actually quite nurturing. I knew nothing about money and business and David the same. They, they actually helped us shape our thinking by asking us the right questions. And, and they helped us structure the beginnings of a company. And actually, the first two years of the company were in my lab and David's lab. The university allowed us to incubate um, before we, uh, we properly spun it out externally when it grew to a certain size. Um, so so my, my, my first experience was uh, a lot of sort of how can we get from here to here to here. I should say one, one interesting question that the venture capital company asked me um, in 1997. They said, what's, what's the global market for whole genome sequencing? I said, that's easy. It's zero at the moment, <laughs> today. But in 10 years' time, we think it might be big. Oh, thanks, Shankar. Um, well, certainly that uh, venture capitalist is uh, very contrarian. I think uh, most of us approach it from what's the market opportunity and very few of us can draw those lines between how the market is going to be like in a, a few years' time. Um, ben, coming back to you, I think uh, you, know, you have experience in the corporate world, you have experience in academia. Um, has that shaped your way of thinking how research can be translated uh, into uh, impact? whether it's in the form of a company or licensing or in some other ways. Yeah, yeah very much. I, I, I think I had this experience out of the academic bubble in a multi multinational, you know, where you get, uh, of course, uh, the kind of questions, you know, how are you? This is very nice, Dr. Fieringa, that you developed this and discovered this in the lab. But how are we going to really make money with it, you know? Are we going to make a product or whatever? And you get these deadlines, you know, okay, we give you three months, you know, and then see all the proof of concept that we can do something with it. This is usually not how we, we think in academic. But, the, uh, the, yes, uh, I, I have been working, of course, my, my main goal is fundamental science. That's what my, most of my group people are working on. Very fundamental problems, you know. Also, some very fundamental questions that will never lead to any application I can predict already. But, I have also always had some projects together with industry, and I'm involved, for instance, in some, some big programs, you know, on sustainability and so. So we built a, ne a big national center for sustainable chemistries. And just to give you a one example um, of a, a practical application, where we just are now in the process of building a company, you know, and that is Acrylates. I'm sure you all used, used Acrylates. If you are not a chemist, you all do paintings. Paint, you know, paint your house, paint something, whatever. Acrylates are used everywhere, eh? because they, the, the painting in your car, the painting of your house, uh, the diapers, there are eight billion tons, uh, eight, more than eight million tons of acrylates are produced every year, you know, all from fossil. 
And then we were doing catalysis and we were using, we wanted to go away from traditional catalysis and do photocatalysis using light, yeah? Photoredox catalysis. And then we discovered that we use wood remains, wood, yeah? That you normally burn, yeah? Biomass, wood, yeah? Not for timber, but just all the remains that you burn. We take it, we take out water, we get a building block, we use oxygen from the air and light and a photoredox catalyst in a tiny amount, and we make a new molecule. And when we were discussing this in our group, yeah, we just, we were saying, hey, wow, this looks like acrylate. And I said, look, we should try maybe to make a polymer out of it, a plastic. And then my students were a bit hesitant because we are not experts in polymer chemistry. But then they said, okay, I made them enthusiastic and we discussed and They said, yes, let's try, you know. So they tried. It turned out to be fantastic, yeah? We filed six patents, you know, in the last three years now. And we uh, have tested, yeah? You know, the only thing we use is oxygen from the air, wood remains, and light, sunlight, and a photocatalyst. The only waste is water. Maybe this is a message to build sustainable chemistry in the future. And then we did a test of a coating. We made a coating. And we did a test with one of the major coating companies in the world. Yeah? And they said, I was so delighted, and my students in particular, they said, the coating is as good as the coating that is used on the car now, on the car manufacturing, you know? So that gives us the incentive to think, okay, this is really something, you know, and we should look now also at the applications. And so currently, we are building now a startup company. We are developing it for different kinds of poly polymers and plastics, etc. And uh, it's a, it's a great adventure because also the students, you know, they get very excited and say, oh, maybe this fundamental discovery. Of course, it has many implications for the future for developing it into a real larger scale, etc. But they got so excited that we teamed up with some engineers from the engineering school. And in the past six months, they have built a mini plant. Because, you know, in industry, yeah, traditional industry, photocatalysis and photochemical process are not so common. Eh? So we have to prove them, to them that this is a viable technology for the future. So we build a mini plant together with these engineering students, my PhD students. And it works. We run it continuously now, and we make a kilogram a week or so in a continuous flow reactor. This was an adventure for the students, and they enjoyed it so much. And they see, oh, wow, I can contribute maybe to a sustainable future. And maybe we can build a company. And then I come to the next step, of course, because we were earlier talking about taking risk. This is also risk-taking, you know, because we don't know if it will ever compete with these cheap acrylates from, from the petrol, petrochemicals. But I'm convinced that it will work because the properties look fantastic. But now we have to get some money. And I would argue that we need more funding agencies, the governments, the science funding agencies, et cetera, that give some short-term proof of concept funding, you know, for, say, maybe two years postdoc or one or two postdocs to prove actually, you know, that we can make the products, show that it is viable, and then go to the big money, you know, the, uh, uh, to get, to get a, a working out better, you know, to get, to get bigger money to, to start up these things. But I think... The, uh, luckily, in Europe, we have now, in the European Research Council, we have the proof of, of concept funding. So I got 250,000 euros, so I can appoint a postdoc yeah, for that, at least for two years or three years, to work it out, to show that it's really viable, you know, and you can show here is the product, you know, and now we go to our money, the people that can support us with, with the larger amounts of money to really develop it. I think more of that kind of short risk no, it's, it's not that much money. You need money, you know, eh, for a few hundred thousand dollars or so, you know, to, to make the first steps. And I think that is often sometimes the problem with PhD students or postdocs, that they want to do something, but then they'd have to spend a lot of time to get some money. We don't need millions. We need something that makes it possible for the next two or three years. And I think this is the kind of risks that our science foundations, the, the government, should take. It's not that much risk, but it will give a lot of new entrepreneurship, in my opinion. Uh, thanks, Ben. And uh, you'll be happy to know that actually Singapore has got some of these uh, programs in place, and Glad happy to, to talk it. to you after this. Um, I'm going to now open it to the floor. I apologize to Alice. I actually had a lot of questions for her, um, but we are running a little bit behind schedule. 
Uh, some house rules on the questions from the floor. I'm not sure whether the others have it, but I'd like you to try to keep your questions to not more than two minutes. Um, also, try not to make it a sales pitch. You know, I don't think they're looking for postgraduate students. If you'd like to pitch that, then obviously you can do that uh, in, in private. Um, I know this, uh, these rules are not very polite, but I'm a VC, so we are not very polite anyway. Um, so with that, you know, let's, let's get that started. Maybe this gentleman over there. Uh, so I am David Azulay from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Israel. My question is to Dr. Chen. And you said that uh, you invest in early stage pro uh, projects. So my question is, would you invest on ideas that still don't have like initial results? Depends on what the idea is. So we have done back of the envelope idea uh, investment. At the same time, the idea will have to mm, will have to have feasibility associated with it that we can imagine it uh, to work. So it depends on the uh, on the technology. Um, and also another thing. Th uh, to, to think about if we are to uh, obtain money from the private sector is who you should be talking to. So do the homework in terms of uh, the different firms because to your point, there are firms who would do it and there are firms who would prefer to invest in later stage technology. So I would say the key thing is to do the homework to figure out which granting agencies or institutions would do it. A lot of times angel funding and early stage C funding might be able to uh, be more open to ideas like that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, maybe this young lady there. Yep, thank you. I'm Santi. I'm from Cancer Research UK Scotland Institute. Uh, my question is about, I think we know entrepreneurship is a spectrum. So that we start as a scientist. We can do licensings up to establishing a startup company. Um, I think uh, the panels in front of us start the company when they're already very established scientists. So my question is, uh, how early is early? And then I know we can say that it's as start as soon as possible, but how to balance your scientific career with your entrepreneurship? For instance, I'm talking about, this is not uh, self uh, selling, but it's just uh, learning from my experience. When I start my startup company a few years ago, I was in the end of my PhD, but I don't want to leave my scientific post. So I'm now a postdoc uh, or general faculty in Indonesia and in the UK. But then I might be one year behind my nature paper <laughs> because I have this entrepreneurship uh, venue. So what do you think about that? And is there any way around it? Thank you. Thanks, Santi. And we had a conversation a few days ago, I recall, yeah, on the rooftop. Thank you. Um, maybe would any of the panelists like to take that question? Um, ben? Yeah, I, I think this is a dilemma, you know, because you cannot do everything, you know, at the same time. You have to find a bit of a balance. And yes, of course, when you put effort in, your, in a company or whatever, it will delay a little bit the other things that you are doing. But that does not mean that you should not do it. I have in my, my group, me, I mean, we as seniors, we can start companies, you know, as we mentioned, you know, and involved. But my philosophy is to, to help your students, to get the students doing it, you know, the young people, to start things, you know, entrepreneurship, etc. That is my philosophy. Encourage them. I don't need a company, you know. I want to encourage them to start something. But I have a girl in my group who is a PhD student from Romania, and uh, she does a PhD, she does a wonderful job, yeah? She's in the first year of a PhD, yeah? And, and mid, but she has a, her own company, yeah? Doing training programs for other people, et cetera. And she told me that she gets up at six o'clock in the morning, she works one and a half hour on her company, and then she goes for her work at the PhD, you know? And I, I don't see that she is working <laughs> less dedicated or she has less success or whatever, you know, it goes great. But once again, you have to find a good, Good, good balance there, yeah? Two of my daughters together have built a company because they both work, you know, as teachers and in a multinational now, you know, they just finished their studies. But they started a company, yeah? What they do in the evening or in the weekend, that is programs for banks and for other big companies that want to have a nice, um, uh, how do you call it, event, a nice dinner or a party or whatever. And during that, they want to have games. So they started a gaming company for banks and for other companies, just for fun, you know. 
and they make some money with it. And it's for them, it's a, it's a lot of fun to make for a group of 30 bankers, yeah, while they have the yearly event to make uh, to make games, you know, and and keep them uh, busy for one or two hours or so, yeah. So you can do it in different forms, you know, but you have to find a balance for yourself, yeah. You can also decide, you know, to, to stop with the PSD and start a co start full time on your company. But yeah, then you you take a really good risk, I think, you know. But maybe maybe my advice: first finish your PSD, yeah, and then. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, I, I may have a different opinion here. Um, I think you have to ask yourself fundamentally what you're interested in doing with your life. Are you interested in scholarship, or are you interested in the application of scholarship? If, the, if, the, if it's the first, then I think you have to devote yourself purely to the scholarship. Uh, and when you come to the, to the end of that, if you then choose commerce or application, then you can branch out and join a company, start a company. But if your intention is to be a scholar, you have to devote yourself 100% of your time to that, in my estimation. So I'm very concerned uh, about the, the idea that a graduate student or a postdoctoral fellow could work uh, you know, evenings and weekends on some application of that knowledge, rather than spending evenings and weekends as well as during the day working on the basic science. Uh, I would not encourage my own students or postdocs to divert their attention from the question, the basic science question at hand. However, m at this point, most of my students and postdocs, then after they finish in my lab, choose to go into biotechnology because of the opportunities and the excitement and the prospect of working on a team rather than individually. And that's great. I think it's been a wonderful change when I started, there was no biotechnology industry. Everyone uh, had only the aspiration to do basic science. That is, there's been a sea change, which I appreciate and uh, certainly encourage. But while you're in the laboratory answering a basic science question, I feel you have to be entirely devoted to that, uh, to that effort. Can I, can I briefly react on this? Please. Because I not fully disagree, uh, agree with uh, my neighbor here. You know. When you do a PhD, when you do science, you know, take advantage of these opportunities. Focus on that. I fully agree. But don't spend 24 hours on your PhD. Find a good balance. Do also something different, you know. And that can go in sports, going out with friends, listening to music. It resets and reshapes your mind, and you can refresh your mind. It's not good to work 24 hours a day on your PhD. And some people like, I have now this experience with this girl in my group. For her, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, to have her own company, you know, and she spends a few hours, maybe one hour or one and a half hour a day, instead of going to, to play tennis or so, yeah, or ping pong, yeah. So this is what she does for for not not that it affects her PhD. So once again, yeah, I agree, you should focus on what is your main goal, getting a PhD, yeah, but also find a bit of a balance, you know. Shankar, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you uh, give me your opinion on this, given the opinions that you have heard from your two? Uh, Fellow panelists. <laughs> I will, happily. Um, I mean, f firstly, on, on your first point, um, actually, w w when I founded Selexo with David Klenerman, we, were, uh, we weren't even tenure track. Okay. Um, and actually, we were, certainly my, my situation was, uh, I, I was looking at my contract finishing in two years' time. And uh, I had no track record other than my postdoctoral work and so on. Um, so so it, it, you don't necessarily have to be established. It's easier when you're established if, if you want to do it. Um, now, fr from my point of view, um, when, whenever I've started um, a company, it, it's, it's come out of basic science. And um, my reason for starting something is that I, I've seen an opportunity and I've felt that if I don't push this, nobody will. And it th then becomes a question of... Um, things do get picked up sometimes by other people. It depends on the nature of the problem. But, but sometimes you feel... Well, I felt almost a, a responsibility to have a go. And um, if, if you have a vision for something, you you probably have to drive it, at least set it in motion. 
Now, how, how to marry that with um, an academic career, it's, re it's really quite difficult. It's hard work. You, you have to find extra hours. But my objective has always been to obsolete myself from the company as quickly as possible. And you can do that in stages. Uh, one, th there are a lot of aspects that are not scientific. Um, so you can, you can bring in good people to do that. And where I've sort of continued an involvement, it, it's been purely as a scientific advisor, just, just on the science, because that's the part where I feel I can contribute, perhaps uniquely, to, to what the company's doing. And all the other things can be done much better by professional people who um, are CEOs or COOs, et cetera. Now, with P I, I had two PhD students who started a company during their PhD, which I did not know about. <laughs> and um, I wasn't very pleased, actually, when I found out. Because uh, here I, I'm with Randy, actually. I think when you're doing a PhD, you, you really need to focus on it. Um, by all means, do other things. But, but your PhD has to be you know, your only professional priority. And, and that's a foundation for you can do entrepreneurial things and so on afterwards. Now, my students, um, they'd been to the business school on some uh, pitching competition that the university holds, which, which I'm, I'm also mixed about, actually. Uh, I think there, nowadays there are lots of distractions for students under the guise of postgraduate training problem. And actually, they, in your PhD, I think you're, prime, you're there to learn how to do research full stop. All the other things are much lower priority, but I see the other things starting to dominate now. So they, they generated an idea and they formed a company. Now they didn't actually materially form it until after their PhD. So they finished their PhDs and then they raised venture capital. And um, So again, no, no track record. Um, they, they, it's now 200 people and it's, it's, they've got a product and it's, it's going well. But, but I do think during your PhD and postdoc, you, you really need to get your head down and focus on what you're doing. And I think as an academic, if, if you do see an opportunity and feel that actually you must drive it, you must drive it because it's your vision, then if, if you do something about it, my advice is to then try and obsolete yourself as quickly as possible. Hang in there with the science, maybe, as a scientific advisor. But if you want to run a company, I think you have to leave your profession and you know, become a professional full-time entrepreneur and do it, do it properly. It's hard to do both. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, Shankar. Um, perhaps this gentleman over here on my right. OK. Um, hi. My name is Take. I'm from the University of Tokyo in Japan. And uh, my question is about the boundary of your specialty or your field, uh, boundary between your field and what others do in the path of discovery of basic science to development of product in the society. Um, probably I'm grasping the answer to my questions. But let's say we find, we find a nice technology or basic science. Probably some people just publish it and they let it go because yeah, he or she main wants to maintain the integrity of science, but others may get it patented and sell it, or others may run a business so that um, he or she can be involved in the enhancement of um, implementation of that technology in the society. But definitely most of people want to pay it forward in some forms. And the, probably a short answer would be, do what you want to do, but I want to just ask your cases about my questions about you. Do you have, do you have, whether you happen to have a clear boundary between what you do and what others do in my mind, in your mind? I think this was something that Randy uh, was talking about in terms of the sequencing of the uh, when IP, when you publish, when you reg when you file IP, when you commercialize, I don't know. Is is this a question that any of you would like to take? 
But I think we have different opinions on this, yeah. so uh, that's uh, the, the beauty of this. Uh, of this Always panel. good. Yeah. Um, I, I give you an example that almost makes me seem silly, but uh, after the after the Nobel Prize, um, I was interviewed by a reporter at the Washington Post about what motivated um, my interest in the subject that I researched, and I talked about the basic science that that we did and the discoveries we made, and then I talked about the application, which I mentioned earlier was uh, a company, a local company, introducing the gene for human insulin into yeast. Uh, and then, you know, engineering it so that it could be a production vehicle. And the reporter said, uh, did, you, did you do any of those experiments in your lab? And I said, no, why would I? And he, he said, what do you mean, why would you? It was an obvious practical application of some significant clinical benefit. And I said, no, I, I didn't. If I had put human insulin into yeast, that wouldn't teach me anything about the mechanism of secretion. So I didn't care. I was happy to contribute my knowledge to the company that was doing the engineering. But for me, I was entirely focused on the basic science. And this reporter was simply incredulous. He kept repeating himself, thinking that I was just some kind of moron that I <laughs> that didn't want to uh, apply this knowledge. Well, I did want to see the knowledge applied. That wasn't the question that I was posing for myself. And so I'm happy with the outcome, both for myself and for this biotechnology company. I, I think that's a different attitude, one that I will continue to defend until my dying day. <laughs> any, any other opinions or...? I, I, I had so often, you mentioned this now, these questions you get about applications. I work on these molecular machines, which is extremely fundamental science. It's about motion, you know, with synthetic systems. And every time I got this question, you know, by journalists and so, so where is it good for? Why do we need this? Why, what is the applications? And I said, look, I have no idea. I only know yeah, that your body, it moves. You transport, you move, I can speak to you. Uh, all these things, you know, and so these materials around us, nothing moves, you know. So if we ever want to make responsive materials, we want to make things that self-repair, that self-heal, that can sell, that, that can adopt. Sometimes maybe we need motion, you know, as a fundamental principle. Oh, 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 yeah, where can we apply it for? Are you going to watch applications, you know? So we get these questions, yes, but I stick with the fundamental science, but maybe... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of split this into two things. So one is really about what kind of research should we be doing in universities? And I think the other is about crossing the line from basic to, to translation. And should you do that in a university environment? So first question, um, first part of that, um, without basic science, um, my view is innovation will dry up in five years' time. There'll be no translation that's um, based on anything new. Um, now, um, we once had a, many years ago, we once had a science minister who made a statement in Parliament, and he said, everything that should be discovered has already been discovered. <laughs> and so uh, all researchers should now be working on useful applications. This was actually said. Um, now, um, this was quite a long time ago. Um, so so I, I'll continue to defend that. I, I think actually what we should be doing in university um, research should be basic science. Um, and partly to build knowledge. And from that knowledge, um, there'll be possibilities for innovation at some point in the future. We don't know when. Um, and so, uh, actually, I, I've, I've never been a fan of government funding schemes to do applied science. And we, we've tended to have some of the larger funding schemes in the UK for applied science. And um, I once said to a Treasury minister, this is a waste of my taxpaying money. <laughs> Give me one useful thing that's come out of these applied initiatives into which you sink so much funding. You'd be much better off putting it into responsive mode research. Um, so, so actually, I, I, I feel it should start with, with, with basic science. Now, um, 
what happens if there is a an incidental observation or discovery that could lead to somewhere useful? Now, I think this depends very much on what it is and what its potential is. And it also depends on your own, your own interest levels. Um, one way of dealing with this is to, is, is to file a patent and license it out to uh, existing companies or someone else's startup company. It's an acceptable mechanism. Um, another approach is to simply publish it and not protect it and allow others to, to pick up on it. And I think sometimes that is the right thing to do. And then the, the third approach is to decide or feel, I have to do something about this. Because I have a vision, which maybe not everyone else has. And I want to take the first step and set it in a certain direction. Now, I, I, I've done the latter once or twice. And um, when I've done that, I've, uh, I mean, one reason to found a company is to actually separate it from the research going on in your lab in the university. So I, I, I feel we shouldn't be constrained by one model here because every situation is different and we're all different individuals and we should have, there should be some flexibility. Um, and we shouldn't be sort of forced to do one thing or the other. Thanks, Schenker. I'm, I'm afraid we are almost running out of time. Uh, in fact, we probably only have time for just one last question. I apologize. Uh, you know, I've been threatened with dire consequences if you know, we exceed the time. So maybe the last question for the young lady here on my left. Hi, I'm Cindy from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, and thank you all for your important insights. So, Professor Shankar, you have mentioned that uh, you've been approached by 35 companies uh, in one of your discoveries, and Dr. Alice also mentioned that finding investors two-way street. Um, how do you evaluate which company you want to take on in your startup journey so it will help your uh, company, uh, startup going in the right direction. Alice, maybe you want to take that first? Sure. So selection of investors, is that uh, the question? So uh, I would say you need to first know your project and know the needs of your project first. And based on that need, you go look, out, uh, look for investors who can provide some of that need. And I would say it would be rare if you can find all the things a te technology needs in one investor. So then the alternative is, if you do, that, that's great, but uh, the alternative would be to identify a syndicate, a syndicate of investors. And in that sense, you figure out who perhaps uh, certain investors would have the connections, certain investors would have the tec uh, technical background, certain investors would have the commercialization capabilities, et cetera, so that you build a syndicate that will best provide for your company. Of course, prior to that, you'll need to know what the, the company might need. Um, and then that would go into a, a, a more fundamental question, which is how do you know what the company needs? You need to do a lot of, um, a lot of discussions, talk to people who have done it or who have been in the space or who uh, would, might have insights to help you un identify the need of the company, then you can go out and do your homework in terms of who you should be talking to. Okay, maybe Shankar, last words from you. Yeah, f founder's perspective, a slightly different perspective. I think investors are all different. Um, if, if you have a very clear vision for what you want to build, I think it's very important to find an investor that who aligns with your vision. Um, misalignment is bad for everyone, right? The comp it doesn't end well. Bad marriage. Uh, absolutely. Um, th the other thing I would say is uh, when I started Selexa, I didn't understand the terms and details of the investment until many, many years later when it was a big success. And everybody made money apart from the founders and the scientists. 
a common story. People assume, people assume I have a private jet and they see my rusty old bicycle and they, they become confused. Um, they become even more confused when I say to them, actually, I don't care. I, wasn't, I didn't do it for the money. It really doesn't matter. Um, but you know, my, my advice to you is that if you, if you found a company, if you can find someone who's, who's more of a business-orientated person to do it with you, they, they, will, they will look after your interests. And present company in, uh, ex accepted, v venture capitalists generally don't look after you in the areas where they have expertise. Thank you. And so there's a misalignment. <laughs> there's a misalignment of knowledge of how how certain things can work. And we tend to focus on the science. So I would say watch out for that. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. And with that, I will bring the panel session to a close. I'd like to thank my fellow panelists. I think they've done a great job. Maybe a round of applause for them.